Okay, everybody, here we are at our very last week. Okay, this is another short week, hooray, right? Um, we are going to just finish out what happened in the 90s and then up, up to the, the year 2001. All right, so this is officially week 33. Uh, we have our project due next week. Okay, so here's what you are going to do. I hope I've explained this thoroughly, but let's go back through it. You're going to choose an American person or an event and write a short report. So it's going to be like a, a biography or a report on a battle or whatever. It has to be American history, of course. You're going to make a PowerPoint and uh, about four, five to six slides long with some pictures in there and just explain to us what's going on, okay? Uh, next week uh, at regular class time, so that'll be Wednesday at 2.30. Is that right? Can't even remember. 2.30? Um, yeah, I think that sounds right. We will have the Zoom class and you will present it during the Zoom class. Okay, we'll do a screen sharing thing so that you can present it. You'll be talking over it. You can record it if you like. I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. But you, it turns out my computer, if you send it to me, I can't get the audio on it for whatever reason. It's probably my computer that's just ancient and all that kind of stuff. But you can record it yourself so that you don't have to worry about talking live. Okay, so this is how uh, you do that. All right, so this is the one I did for marine biology, you can see. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to your PowerPoint, okay, and you're going to go up there, you see where it says slideshow, and now record slideshow, and you, re you, you select so start recording from beginning, and now it tells you start recording, and presuming that you have a microphone on your computer, you will start talking, all right, and then this, I you did this to get the uh, picture right, it looks a little funny, but, so you'll start talking about what's going on, and then you'll click to the next slide, and you'll read to us or whatever about whoever this person is, hopefully with a picture. This particular presentation didn't have many pictures except this awful picture. Um, so then you get to that and then you, um, then it's at the end. Okay, so then you're talking over it. And as you do that, then you will, when we get together in class, we'll do a screen share. You'll, you'll click screen share. I think this works. And then you will push play on your, um, PowerPoint and it will start playing and it should play for the whole group to see if that I uh, hope that's I hope that's the way it works okay I hope it works that way um, and then and then it'll it'll be done if you do not want to record it you can just click it and and talk live during class time okay so that's the idea if you need any uh, inspiration or whatever you can you can bounce some ideas off me if you like you know if there's been a particular person that we've come across throughout the, it can be the whole year, it doesn't have to just be the last part of the year, but any person that has fascinated you or something like that, you can pick them and tell us some things about that person's life. Uh, keep in mind that uh, if you go uh, look somebody up, they are human, and sometimes you might find out some things you don't like so much, so uh, just keep that in mind. Okay, so that's next week, okay? All right, so here goes the rest of our history today. We ended last week with uh, 1988, there was an election and the Vice President of the United States at the time was George Herbert Walker Bush, George H.W. Bush, and he's running against a Democrat named Dukakis and a Democrat named Benson. I honestly don't remember Benson running. I don't know if that's Lloyd Benson from Texas. I don't remember that happening because I was alive at this time. Uh, I voted in this election. I voted for George Bush. Um, my very first election to vote, and I failed to tell you this last time because uh, I had to rush through that presentation, you may have noticed. Uh, my very first time to ever vote for president, uh, I was 18 years old and I voted for Ronald Reagan in 1980. So it was, uh, I was really proud to do that. I was a big fan of his. I still am. Uh, even afterwards, after studying him, I'm still a big fan of his. So in 88 then, uh, Bush was kind of riding on the popularity of Reagan. Remember, he couldn't run again. So, um, and you can see electorally, it was a landslide right here. And popular uh, 53 to 45 is pretty, that's a pretty big uh, margin right there. And just looking at the map, all the red on there, you can see that uh, Bush was popular at this time. Um, one of the uh, promises he made, he said, read my lips, no new taxes. And so a lot of the conservatives like that. Here's Michael Dukakis, who was incredibly liberal, very liberal. Um, and, and promised to raise taxes. Okay, so it was a pretty clear difference right there. But Bush won. He became uh, the 41st president of the United States. In fact, a lot of people refer to him today as Bush 41 because, as you know, his son also will become president, uh, also named George Bush. So we have to distinguish them between Bush 41 and Bush 43. Uh, and we'll get to him in just a minute. 
All right, let's watch a little fun video about uh, George Bush's life. It was pretty extraordinary. Our 41st president, George H.W. Bush, was not the flashiest, most exciting president around, even though this mild-mannered man was once America's top spy? Well, yes, for a year, George Bush was the head of the Central Intelligence Agency. But did you also know that President George Bush was once a teenage fighter pilot? He has lived one of the great American lives. He was the youngest bomber pilot in the Navy in World War II. The very youngest one. He's a teenager. Uh, you know, the time when you know a lot of teenagers couldn't even drive a car, he was flying a plane and risking his life, and he was even shot down. It was almost a miracle that he survived that war and then went on to be the president. He's a wonderful man. A top spy? A fighter pilot? Certainly exciting. But what George Bush should really be known for is... being the father of our 43rd president, George W. Bush? Well, there is that. But no, he should be known for being a dedicated public servant. Okay, not too flashy, but as a teacher, a congressman, and an ambassador, President Bush spent most of his life serving the public good. And in 1988, George H.W. Bush landed America's top job, becoming our 41st president. During his administration, the Berlin Wall came down, uniting Germany and symbolizing the end of the communist threat to democracy. As the Cold War ended, the U.S. and Russia even stopped pointing nuclear missiles at each other. Well, a few missiles anyway. Meanwhile, in the rest of the world, other conflicts were heating up. In 1990, Iraq's leader Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. In response, President Bush launched Operation Desert Storm. Iraq must withdraw from Kuwait completely, immediately, and without condition. And force Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait in less than two months. Things were going well for the president's administration, which also saw the landmark passing of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which helped protect our nation's disabled from discrimination. Unfortunately, the economy slid into a recession, taxes were raised, and the only thing people remembered was Bush telling them, Read my lips. No new taxes. No new taxes. Well, there were no new taxes, but he did raise the old ones. And that didn't go over very well with the voters who sent him packing in 1992 at the end of his one term in office. George Herbert Walker Bush, the next president after Reagan, also I think will get pretty good marks from history. He's not gonna be one of our greatest presidents, but he presided over the final dissolution of the Soviet Union. And in the first Gulf War with Saddam Hussein, the now deceased dictator of Iraq, he put together a coalition that did it right. That's right. Throughout his career, George H.W. Bush proved that you didn't need to do it flashy. You just needed to do it right. All right, there we go. So we're going to look at a couple of those details, uh, namely that war that uh, started during his term. So that would be called the Gulf War. We'll watch a little video in just a minute. But this man was put in charge of the Gulf War, so he was kind of the top general, if you will. His name is Norman Schwarzkopf. They called him Storm and Norman. Notice he's very decorated. What are we looking at there? Four-star general. That's tough to get. And so what was um, interesting about this guy was that every day he would give an update on TV about what was happening in the war. And he was very engaging, and he was kind of funny, and, and, and we would see live pictures of, of a bomb going somewhere, and he would say something like, well, this guy had an unlucky day, or no, it missed a truck, and he said that, guy, that guy's had the luckiest day of his life because uh, it hit a bridge right after a truck went over it. So funny things like that kept us informed. And, of course, it was a very decisive battle that took place. So here's kind of the timeline of what's going on here. Uh, it all has to do with Iraq invading another country, a, a, a sovereign country. And then we just started something called Desert Shield, and which turned into Desert Express and into Desert Storm. And um, we're going to see, here we go, till February, right? So it started here, but the actual battle didn't start till, I think, right about here. Yeah. So let's watch that little video and get a little idea on that. 
Over the past century, the United States has gotten involved in its fair share of Middle Eastern affairs. In 1991, America again found itself in the middle of an armed clash, this time between Saddam Hussein's Iraq and its neighbor Kuwait, in what would become known as the Persian Gulf War. Here are five points you should know to better understand this conflict. Few people would have called Saddam Hussein a stable leader. From the start of his reign in 1979, he ruled with an iron and often reckless fist. In 1990, Saddam sought to acquire Kuwait's vast oil reserves. Publicly, he justified the invasion by claiming that Kuwait belonged to Iraq in the first place and had been unfairly carved out as a separate country by the League of Nations. However, Kuwait actually became independent before Iraq's sovereignty, making his thinly veiled argument ridiculous. Either way, Saddam seized Kuwait on August 8, 1990, causing an international uproar, with the United States being the loudest voice. The United States strongly condemns the Iraqi military invasion of Kuwait. Soon after the invasion, the United Nations Security Council declared that if Saddam's forces did not withdraw from Kuwait by January 15, 1991, military force would be used. You can guess what happened. On January 16th, the offensive against the Iraqi army began, fought by a broad coalition of armed forces from the United States, United Kingdom, France, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt, among many others. The first stage of the Gulf War was named Operation Desert Shield, which actually began before the international coalition was brought together. When Saddam first invaded Kuwait, the United States rushed troops into Saudi Arabia, the world's largest oil exporter, to prevent a possible attack. But after the Security Council's declaration of war, it became the American force that would invade Kuwait. The main phase of the war was codenamed Operation Desert Storm, which began on the morning of January 17, 1991. Desert Storm was a massive bombing campaign targeting Iraqi aircraft, anti-air defenses, oil refineries, communication lines, weapon factories, bridges, and roads using the latest American military technology, including stealth bombers, cruise missiles, and smart bombs. After a month of Desert Storm, the coalition aimed to finish the job. The coalition's ground offensive, known as Operation Desert Saber, began on February 24th, 1991. By February 28th, the war was over. And as president, I can report to the nation, aggression is defeated, the war is over. In four days, the US-led forces retook Kuwait's capital and forced the entire Iraqi army into retreat. In all, Iraq lost somewhere around 30,000 soldiers, while America and its allies only lost 292 total. The Persian Gulf War was an easy and lopsided victory for the United States, but not one without serious consequences. President George H.W. Bush decided not to depose Saddam Hussein, as he didn't believe regime change would be popular with America's allies. In the wake of the war, Kurdish and Shiite Iraqis rose up against Saddam, who in turn brutally crushed their rebellions. After the UN accused him of using chemical weapons against his own civilians, Saddam was forced to allow UN inspectors into Iraq. He barred the inspectors in 1997, and from then on, it became the United States' goal to remove Saddam from power. All right, so that ended that war, and it was a very decisive defeat. Let's go back to that. Let's back there. Very de decisive, so much so that, that George Bush was uh, very popular. I mean, his popularity was up to like 96%. That's almost unheard of. All right, so that... He really, really nailed it on that one. So uh, made America look really, really good. So remember, uh, we learned about uh, Ronald Reagan talking to uh, Gorbachev and said, you know, Mr. Gorbachev's chair down this wall. This is the Berlin Wall. And uh, at the little time went by, but it was really during George H.W. Uh, Bush's um, time as president that it actually came down. Okay, so the Berlin Wall was torn down at this time, which kind of then will uh, set the stage for the, uh, the winning of the Cold War. So the Cold War now is deemed over and uh, that the West won, so America won. So George W. Bush on this giant wave of popularity uh, starts running for president again and then something happened. Now in the video it talked about how the uh, economy went down. It did go down some, but it wasn't, it wasn't catastrophic. 
or anything like that. The biggest problem, I would say, was that he did acquiesce to the, the Congress, to the Democrat Congress, who raised uh, taxes. And it was very easy for Clinton to come along, this is Bill Clinton on the right, to come along and point that out in all sorts of campaign commercials and saying, oh, he said he wouldn't raise taxes and he raised taxes. And so people had kind of soured on it. Furthermore, Clinton had this um, charisma about him, you know, sort of like uh, hearkening back to the John F. Kennedy era. He was young, he was handsome, he was energetic. He sort of represented the new, um, uh, the new younger generation, whereas George Bush was, you know, was a World War II veteran, so he was kind of the older generation. And so now we see, you know, do away with the old, bring in the new, let's have some fresh blood in it and this kind of thing. Furthermore, he was a very effective campaigner, uh, made some pretty devastating um, accusations against Bush about uh, being, you know, racist, and just stuff that really wasn't fair, okay, for him like that. Now, Bill Clinton is from uh, Arkansas, so he was Southern, um, and so he, uh, in, the, in the South, the Southerners tend to vote for their Southern brothers, and then this came along. So, this is another man who ran uh, as a third party. So, typically, when you have a third party candidate, that candidate will take away votes from one of the other two, all right? This is H. Ross Perot, a wealthy Texas businessman, and he was actually involved in, in that failed rescue attempt to get the, uh, the, the hostages out of Iran. Um, he, uh, it was called Operation Desert Claw or something. He was part of that deal, and it, and it was failed, but he had helped to pay for it because he's very, very wealthy. So he decided to run because he thought all this politics was a bunch of hooey and that we just need to... Uh, take care of the country by uh, by taking care of the people. Kind of this kind of no-nonsense, almost like an Andrew Jackson kind of a guy. So he comes along. He's also criticizing George H.W. Bush. In fact, they were enemies from way back. If You may not know this, but George H.W. Bush did spend some time... Hold on. Okay, so you can see here uh, what, went, what happened. Okay, so even though Ross Perot did not win a state... Look what he did to the vote. Wow, 18.8%, almost 19%. That is significant. All right, he didn't get electoral stuff, nothing like that, but he ate into very clearly George Bush's uh, uh, votes right there. So I was mentioning that George H.W. Bush had spent a lot of time in Texas, so he had been a, he kind of considers himself a Texan. His son, George W. Bush, does consider himself a Texan. And so George H.W. had come down to Texas to be part of the oil business, you know, working in the oil patch, and H. Ross Perot was part of that as well, and they had become, they had clashed before this, and they sort of were not very friendly to one another. So a lot of people believe that it's very possible that Ross Perot ran uh, just to mess up George Bush's chance of winning re-election. And then with a very attractive, uh, you know, pleasant person like Clinton running, he was able to take it away. Notice that Clinton, Clinton did not get over 50%, though. Look, 42.9% is all he got. So, but he got the most, right? And then electorally, you can see that explained itself there, which, of course, we know that is the important number right there. But look at the map right there. You can see pretty much a split going on there. Uh, Texas probably went with Bush because he would consider himself a Texan, and Texans will usually vote for Texans. Um, notice that Arkansas went for Clinton, but some of these other uh, southern states did not go for Clinton, and part of the deal was there is there was a question about his character. All right, he was sort of a playboy type, this kind of thing, and certainly he was liberal, and so the liberal states uh, went with him and not really caring about the character right there, but some of the southern states... Uh, cared about the character, and it, it, though, those chickens will come home to roost for that. There's Ross Perot right there, who pretty much wrecked it. So here goes Bill Clinton. He becomes president number 42, kicking George H.W. Bush out after only one term. Um, and so, but Bush did go on to be, become friends later with Bill Clinton. I don't think with Perot, but... And he had, you know, his young family. So here's his wife, Hillary, who you probably heard of, and his daughter, um, Chelsea, who I think was a teenager, maybe a, a, an older teenager. I do think she lived in the White House with them at the time. So it was, it was a time of kind of hopefulness and, and you know, uh, maybe a little more fun kind of a thing. So let's look at a couple of things that, that Bill Clinton was able to accomplish while, while uh, president. 
first of all, he um, nominated this woman to be part of the Supreme Court. This is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She is still on the Supreme Court today. Um, she's, I believe, 94 or something like that. So I don't know how much longer she'll be on the Supreme Court. But it's one of his, uh, according to him, his greatest uh, accomplishments because uh, Ginsburg has become quite a voice for the, for the activist liberal wing of the, uh, of the Supreme Court. Um, so, you know, not necessarily using the Constitution to guide the laws, but using, I don't know, um, a, a liberal sensibility to help guide her there. He is making friends here with the leader of Russia. Okay, so this, this leader of Russia, while they used to be like intimidating, you know, Mikhail Gorbachev came along and, and now the, the, the wall is down in Berlin and, and the Cold War is over and Gorbachev retired, uh, sort of like, so he was the counterpart to, to, uh, to Ronald Reagan and even with Bush uh, during his term. But this guy's name is Boris Yeltsin. And Boris Yeltsin was uh, a, kind of a goofy, fun-loving, happy kind of a guy. He didn't seem harmless. He didn't seem harmful at all. Uh, but that was kind of like Nikita Khrushchev. Khrushchev was all kind of bubbly and everything, but he was just a, a communist at heart. So Boris Yeltsin, Yeltsin wasn't as much that, but he was a heavy drinker. And here you can see he said something apparently that was uh, sort of embarrassing, and, and Clinton is laughing and covering his face because of some goofy thing that Boris Yeltsin said. But they became good friends. And, uh, and then, therefore, the relationship between America and Russia was getting better, was getting better. And furthermore, the USSR is going to break up at this point. So a bunch of, the, of those countries that had been part of the Iron Curtain, part of the, uh, the United Socialist uh, Soviet Republic, uh, were now becoming their own nations. You know, some of the stands, Kurdistan and places like that, and, and uh, Lithuania. Uh, so Russia now is getting smaller. And it's going to be called Russia, not USSR anymore, okay? So uh, there's elections and things like this. It's still got that communist flavor even to today. There's still a little bit of that, uh, that uh, intimidation going on. Uh, but for the, for the sake of history, we consider the Cold War over at this point. He also tried to bring about peace in the Middle East, just like Jimmy Carter had done, right? And so right here, we see something known as the Oslo Accords. So that's Itzhak Rabin, the leader of Israel on the left, and Yasser Arafat, the supposed uh, li leader of the Palestinians. Okay, so the Palestinians were a group of people in the same place as Israel and claimed that Israel was theirs and that the Jews had taken it from them and they wanted it back. Well, uh, he, on the right there, is a terrorist. All right, so... Clinton gets them together. Here they are shaking hands. We're going to have peace between the Jews and the Palestinians. And within two years, Itzhak Rabin had been, got assassinated. Remember what happened back when Carter did this. But Rabin was assassinated by a Jew, uh, a, a right-wing Jew who was very upset that he had shaken hands with a terrorist like, um, like this guy. So, so it did not work out in the end. It's almost like a repeating, I'm going to bring around uh, peace in the Middle East. But really, it's only God that's going to be able to bring about peace in the Middle East. There's no other way it's going to come that way. So that didn't work out for him. Now, this domestically was a big problem for Clinton. Waco, of course, is real close to us. It's here in Texas. And there were a group of people in Waco who had purchased some land and, and built a building. They were a cult. Okay, so this cult of people called themselves the Branch Davidians. Not sure what that means, but they had a leader who had led them out to this place, and they um, were just living separately from the world, having their own little group. They were homeschooling their kids. They didn't leave from the place. They had their own farm, things like this. And so you think, you know, well, they can just be left alone out there. If they leave us alone and we leave them alone, no big deal. Well, it turns out that they started stockpiling a bunch of weapons. So that, the, the America found out about that. The, the law found out about that. And they said, you can't stockpile all these weapons. And they said, well, yes, we can. The Second Amendment of the United States uh, Constitution allows us to do this. But they thought they were getting very nervous. So the Clinton administration sent in federal troops to go try to confiscate the weapons that these guys had been stockpiling. The leader of the group was a guy named David Koresh. So I guess Branch Davidians, I guess it has to do with his name right there. And he claimed to be the Messiah, you know, crazy stuff like that. 
So here is the uh, National Guard going in, the ATF, it's the, um, so it's the federal police, if you will. And they actually climbed a ladder to the, to the top of the, the building up there and went in through a window. Well, unbeknownst to them, the people inside, remember they're part of a cult, they're told by David Koresh at this point that this is the end time and that, um, you know, the devil's there, essentially. And so they burned the place down, all right? So here it is, and this is the picture we get, and we're like, oh my goodness, the whole place is on fire. Keep in mind, the Branch Davidians, the cult members, did the burning. They started the fire, and they did not get out. So they all died in the fire. And furthermore, some of those uh, ATF officers were killed by gunshot. When they started coming in, the Branch Davidians defended themselves and shot at them. Okay, so there was a lot of loss of life at this point in time. Sadly, there were a bunch of children, the kids that were homeschooling and this kind of thing, that all ended dying, up dying there. This was a bad, uh, you know, um, PR for the president. Um, some people were mad at him for going in and trying to confiscate weapons. Some people were mad at him for, um, for not stopping the fire soon enough and letting the people die. Um, so it just was bad press all around uh, and uh, bad news. All right, which brings us into terrorism. So um, terrorism started on the rise at this point. There had been some prior to this, but from this point on, we're going to see lots and lots more of that. I mean, in fact, of course, we'll end the day today with that. Uh, so we have domestic and foreign. So domestic means terrorism against our own people, and foreign is when foreigners come over and terrorize us. So we're going to start, sadly, with uh, domestic. Okay, so in Oklahoma City, there was this building called the Murrah Building, it was a federal building where people who worked for the federal government uh, office, they have offices there. And a man named Timothy McVeigh, who was unhappy with the um, Clinton administration, uh, he was so like maybe a super, super right wing kind of a guy. I don't know that he was racist, uh, but he was certainly of that kind of, um, I don't know, militant mindset. And he decided to send this message to the federal government and he picked this building in Oklahoma City for some reason. Not exactly sure why. I have this little uh, video right here. There's no real sound here, but it's an animation that was done for people to try to understand what happened. So let's take a look at this. So we're going to uh, end up seeing the, um, the building here. So this is the, the Murrow building, and you can see uh, the streets around it. And there's the truck. Okay, so Timothy McVeigh rented that truck and filled it with uh, explosives. All right, so second floor child care, credit union, recruiting, uh, Marine Corps, the DEA, housing and urban development. So several federal places, but on the second floor is a, a nursery with children of the people who work there. All right, so this would be like casing the joint, if you will. Timothy McVeigh would come around and check to see what would be the most vulnerable spot of this building. And he has a, a truck parked outside the front of the building. So it's not like he tried to go inside the building, right? He's parked there, and it turns out, I don't know that he was brilliant this way at all, but he parked it in such a way that it caused pretty maximum damage. So you're going to see here, there's the explosion, a big one. And now you'll see what, these are engineers now telling us what happened with this explosion. So you see the, the, the floorboards, the floors falling down from the middle like that all the way up to the roof. So that blast was quite successful, bringing all that down just, you know, from gravity. And I think we're gonna come in a little closer here and see, let's see, yeah. So we're gonna see how that, that warped those, you see, and caused so much damage. This, this is helpful for engineers in the future to see if there's a way to build something that could withstand explosions or even withstand, in some cases, uh, earthquakes and things like this. So they're showing how this took place. All right, so uh, immense damage, unbelievable damage. Uh, lots of Americans were killed that day, including several of the children in the, in the daycare. Uh, that was just so sad. So this picture is one of the iconic ones from this area. Here's a firefighter bringing out a child from the nursery. I, I'm very sad to report this child did not survive. Very, very sad. Um, all right, so we have the World Trade Center. We learned about it last week, about the building of it and, and, and its structure. Remember, it was built sort of like a bird cage kind of a thing, right? You can see the two towers right there. Well, they have become a target for um, 
uh, for terrorism because they represent this uh, America at its great trading ability, at, at, at its you know, money making it. And they would, some people might say greed, this kind of thing. But it's showing like a huge success for New York City and this kind of thing. All right, so what happened this during the Clinton administration is that a group of terrorists drove a truck laden with explosives into the parking garage. So the parking garage would have been underneath down here, okay? Now, I can't remember if it was the north or the south tower that they went into, but one of them, they drove down into the basement, left, left the car parked there, and then uh, detonated it, and it created a massive amount of damage to the basement area of the building. Now the building was okay. Uh, they had to do quite a bit of re uh, you know renovation stuff. I guess people were killed. People who were in the uh, parking garage at the time, and uh, even some people like I, I think on the first floor area right there, there had been a blast. Maybe I, you know what it was. I think it may have been outside on the sidewalk. The blast came out and killed some people there. Now we went uh, after some. Uh, uh, investigation it was found out that the terrorists that did this were Muslim terrorists who were striking out against the West to uh, to show that they did not like the Western influence over Muslim uh, countries like Iran Iraq places like this and the guy in charge of it was a mullah so a mullah would be a priest of the um, of the Islamic religion and he was he was called the blind sheikh and he was blind and he had orchestrated that we did catch him and he was arrested and put in jail for a while in Kobar Kobar um, it, we had a building here where our our uh, Americans were staying right so our Americans were staying in this building so some um, these were uh, American soldiers you know so US military personnel serving there for the uh, Air Force and Kobar is in Saudi Arabia, so that is a Muslim country. Our guys were housed there, and so this was a terrorist group that happened by Muslims in a Muslim country, but against the Americans right there. So Americans were killed during that, uh, that attack. So once again, attack against the West, but in this case, not on our, on our, um, on our own uh, ground, right? So... And then we have, this is a naval ship out patrolling that general area, the, um, you know, uh, in the, in the Gulf area, the, the Gulf, uh, uh, the Arabian Gulf, uh, that area over there. Sorry, I can't remember the name of it, but this is called the USS Cole. So this is a ship, and what happened was a, a terrorist ship, it was a smaller ship, actually came headed toward it, so driving toward it, you know, floating, uh, boating towards it, and the USS Cole said, oh, you're getting too close, you're getting too close, you need to stop, you need to desist. Well, they didn't stop, and they crashed right into the side of the boat, exploding it as they went. I do believe this was a suicide bombing at this point. So this was a time when we had the people setting off the bombs actually died, right? So that is one of those, you know, hearkening back to the idea of the kamikaze type of a deal. Well, you can see here that the boat did not sink. Of course, they're working on it, you know, uh, pumping out the water and stuff like this. But this was in the area of the boat where the some of the sailors were asleep. They were, their beds were there. So our sailors were actually, several sailors were killed during this attack. And once again, it was the Muslims attacking an American target. We were still, they were still over there, but this was an American target. So we see they're kind of building up what they want to do. Okay, domestically non-terrorist, uh, Clinton did pass a law called NAFTA, which stands for the North American Free Trade Agreement, where there was going to be a new agreement between Canada, America, and Mexico, where there could be trade that was free across those borders right there. I don't know if you've been paying attention at all to politics right now, but this is the um, program that, that Donald Trump just ended and replaced it with something new. I can't remember what they call it. Uh, the America, you know, Canada, Mexico agreement. It's not NAFTA anymore. But the idea here is that you could, uh, there would be free passing along the borders. The reason why people criticized it because uh, Mexico was trading 75% of their goods, but we were only trading with them 14%. Canada, 74%. We only, they only bought 16% of this. So what that was, was it was unequal trading between both countries and U.S., and so the people who were against it said, wait a minute, we're getting all this, you know, stuff from them, buying it from them, making them wealthy, but we aren't getting wealthy off of this deal. There were lower prices that did help. Uh, so a lot of the Americans liked it because of that. And then we had um, 
uh, oil prices were were uh, were better at the, you know that that mad day better. It turns out that Canada and Mexico both have oil, uh, which is part of the export that goes on there. The Dayton Peace Accord. So look what we have here. We have a lot of uh, participants in this. So we're at a conference here to bring about peace once again, right? So and Dayton, that's actually in America. Yeah. So these all guys all came. Let's see if I can figure out who everybody is. We have Clinton, of course. This, I believe, is the Prime Minister of uh, Trudeau of uh, Canada. This is John Major of England. Uh, this is this guy's name is Slobodan Milosevic. I'm surprised he's there. He's kind of a terrorist guy. I think that's him. Maybe I'm mistaken. Hold on. Okay, right. That, so Dayton, Ohio. This is Dayton, Ohio. That is Slobodan Milosevic, it turns out. I looked it up real quick. Uh, because the piece that they're coming up with is the piece for the area where he was, which is in uh, the Balkans, so a place called Bos Bosnia-Herzegovina. And so all of these guys got together to work out a peace agreement because they were, they, were, they were having a war. It was basically a war in Yugoslavia, and this group was getting together to try to uh, bring about an end, an agreement, so that the war in, um, in Yugoslavia would end. It did break up U Yugoslavia into several, several countries. All right, during this time, during the 90s, we have a lot of technology. You probably recognize these two guys right here. He's holding an apple, right? So this is Steve Jobs. That's him very young. This is, um, uh, what's his name? Gates, right? Bill Gates. Uh, so he came up with the apple. He came up with the uh, Windows, uh, the, so the PC. So we have the Apple computer versus the PC, the personal computer. Uh, the Apple came first. It was the first uh, personal computer but he refused, the Apple company refused to share any of their technology. So Gates comes along, comes up with his version of it. There might be some of you out there who are real big Apple fans. And typically if you are, you just, you know, really feel like Gates kind of stole stuff. And maybe he borrowed or something like this. But what Bill Gates said was he would share his, he wouldn't have just one computer you could buy, but you could use his Windows system on any computer. And so lots and lots of computers, like I have a Lenovo computer, I'm using Microsoft Windows because I don't have an Apple. Don't know why I think the PCs are a little more, a little cheaper um, and that kind of thing. Uh, so, but that technology came along where we could have these laptops. Prior to this, the only computer you had was a tower computer. And furthermore, these guys, their first computer they came up with is a, was a tower and a monitor and all that kind of stuff. And laptops were just a, um, an evolution toward that, you know, and I think really Gates came up with that evolution first as far as having personal computers in a laptop, and then the Apple soon followed after that. But we have a third guy. Here he is. This is Michael Dell. He came up with his version. So back in the old days, so we have the tower down here, and here's the monitor. You probably remember this, yes? We had to have our, you know, a mouse with a cord, our keyboard with a cord, our speakers with a cord, all this. But I wanted to show you this picture because this is Michael Dell in a uh, dorm room at the University of Texas at Austin because there's where he was when he developed this system. Uh, he was a student at UT. He decided that he could come up with a better system than either the um, Mac or the uh, Windows, although he uses Windows on his. So this is his own uh, version of something using Windows, right? So a personal computer. But what he did was he made it affordable so that students could buy it. Um, and so that, that, and he started selling a lot. He's, of course, uh, very wealthy right now, but he is a, a Texan, and I think he might even live in Austin now. All right, so Clinton was re-elected pretty, uh, pretty easily. Um, he, was, he was, you know, fairly popular, but there was still that question about his uh, character. So in the very beginning of his second term, so this happened in his second term after re-election, he was caught in a scandal. All right, so this scandal was uh, essentially uh, based on the fact that he had been accused of abusing women when he was younger, okay? So as, as a younger man, when he was governor of Arkansas, there were some women who now are coming forward to say that he had been uh, harassing them, so what we call sexual harassment. And uh, one of these women uh, actually sued him and took him to court. Her name was Paula Jones. And when Bill Clinton, he was, he was uh, compelled by the courts to come testify uh, to tell his side of the story uh, when it had to do with this lady named Paula Jones. And when he was giving his testimony, he, al he lied, okay? So he lied about something with the Paula Jones scandal, okay? Furthermore, he, he did something known as suborning perjury. So suborning perjury is to get somebody else to lie for you. 
All right, so we have those. We know that he did that, okay? And it was enough to bring uh, articles of impeachment against him because he lied under oath to a grand jury, which is absolutely illegal, all right? If you and I did that, we would be in jail. So um, when the proof came out that that was the case, the, the Republican Congress decided to bring impeachment articles against him for perjury and obstruction of justice. And they approved those, okay? So he was impeached. And remember what it means to be impeached. Impeached means to, be, to have basically an indictment brought down against you. So what happens is the indictment says that you must go face a uh, you must go face a judge and jury, and in a case of a p- impeachment, the, the judge and jury would be the Senate. All right. So Clinton became impeached for only a second time in history. Remember the first one? Remember it was Andrew Johnson, the guy that took over after Lincoln was assassinated, and remember that he was not removed from office by one vote. Remember that. So now Clinton's uh, case is now taken before the Senate. The Senate will hear witnesses, and it kind of became a little bit of a, of a circus kind of a thing. And uh, they came out and acquitted him. So his articles failed to win a majority, and so he is acquitted. So we w- it is accurate to say Bill Clinton was impeached, just like it's accurate to say that John- Donald Trump was impeached. But neither were... Uh, were um, convicted. So we've never had a president convicted and thrown out of office under the uh, impeachment clause of the Constitution. The only person that's left office in disgrace, if you will, would have been Nixon when he resigned because he probably would have been impeached and may have been uh, convicted and taken out of office, which have been the first time. But here, Clinton gets acquitted. It did hurt his reputation some because it came out that he uh, had lied, and there was another woman involved. Involved. Her name was Monica Lewinsky. Uh, but where he lied was not about Monica Lewinsky. It was about the Paula Jones situation. And so, uh, but the truth came out about a young woman working in the White House, who he was also uh, harassing or otherwise. Uh, I don't know, dating. I don't know how you want to put it. Okay, so not good. His characters that had been questioned by people previously came back to say, yes, his, he does have a questionable character. All right, so he was a playboy, if you will. And, you know, cheated on his wife. So no good, no good. All right, so he served out his two terms, and the 2000 election comes up now, and his vice president is this man. His name is Al Gore, and Gore's going to run basically on the same platform as Clinton, but yet without the scandals of the personal uh, problems. He was more of a, a, you know, a a Boy Scout. Uh, His father had been a famous uh, senator from Tennessee, so he's Southern And so Southerners tend to get Southern votes and this kind of stuff. And then, of course, on the left, we see George W. Bush. So he's a Texan. Uh, So we have two Southerners running here, and the 2000 election is going to take off. And it was very, very evenly uh, distributed between the guys. It was was a tough one to call who was going to win this. Uh, George W. Bush was very engaging, and and he had sort of that uh, Texas charm going on. Uh, Al Gore was very liberal, and and especially when it came to environmental issues, he wanted to uh, regulate, uh, you know, our lives so that we couldn't use as many, you know, cars and things like this. So that was sort of something that turned off the conservatives. But uh, Bush was this uh, Christian, and and um, and I don't know. They called him a cowboy. They said he was a cowboy. Most people tried to make that he was not very smart. Uh, but he was a graduate of Yale, and all, so don't worry, he was plenty smart. you got to be smart to get this far. He had been governor of Texas. All right, so it all came down in the election to the, to the state of Florida, and what I'm showing you right here is their ballot. Now, y'all haven't voted yet. Uh, someday you will, and typically when we vote here uh, in, this, in this area, we have a page that looks a little bit like a test with little bubbles you fill in with a pencil, okay? So just like a a test that gets filled in ABC kind of a thing. And so if I were voting for here George W. Bush, I would color in that circle. But here they have something where you punch a little stylus down through a hole, and there's a card that he would just put up in there. And that card has these little uh, these little punches on them, and you punch it out. So if the, if the little hole is punched there, that means you voted for him. You can feed that into a computer. The computer counts where the punches are gone. And then you, that's how they count the vote. Notice how many people were 
uh, on the ballot. This is, I don't even remember this. We had George W. Bush and his vice president, Dick Cheney. We had Al Gore and Joe Lieberman. So those are the main ones. But look, we have a libertarian candidate, a green candidate. I do remember him. A socialist workers candidate, something called the natural law candidate. The reform candidate, I don't, I do know Pat Buchanan. I forgot that he had run on this particular year. A socialist, not socialist workers, but socialist candidate. A constitution candidate, don't know anything about that. And workers world, probably communist uh, candidate right there. And so you see how that arrow is pointing to that. But this is called the butterfly ballot. And it was kind of confusing. Somebody may have thought that this was where they were supposed to be punching for Al Gore. Right there, you see. But that was actually for the other side. Right there. Okay. And we have this thing right here where this is the, the punch card. Look kind of like this. You'll see a picture of one, a real one here in a second. But sometimes when it got punched, it didn't punch the whole piece out. And so this thing was called the hanging door Chad. This was called the swinging door Chad. This was called the tri Chad. Not exactly sure why. This was called the dimpled Chad. Maybe somebody started to push and stopped. This one somebody didn't maybe didn't push hard enough. And so what happened was that they decided they had to do a hand recount. And instead of the computer doing, they're looking at these ballots. So you see the ballot looks like this. It's got all those little holes punched in it. And this guy's looking just at the one for president. And he's saying, which one is punched? Is it punched all the way through? Is it completely, is the, is the hole completely, you know, clear? Is, there, is it a hanging chad? Is it a dimpled chad? Is it this kind of stuff? And so what happened was that the state of Florida started counting only in the precincts where the most liberal people in Florida live. And George W. Bush, oh wow, that was thunder. George W. Bush uh, appealed to the Supreme Court and said it was unfair that if they're going to do a recount in Florida, they had to recount all of the counties, not just the four populated ones that have a lot of Democrats living in them. And he ended up winning that argument in front of the Supreme Court. It was an emergency Supreme Court uh, case that was taken. He won that. They did have to stop the Florida count. And I will tell you later on, they did finish the count, uh, you know, officially later, and they did find out that George W. Bush did indeed win the state of Florida. So some people claim, complained about that, that he, you know, they stopped it before they could find out that, that Al Gore really had won it. And it really did come down to that one state. That's 25 electoral votes right there. Look how, how slim this was. 271 to 266. You see how 25 was important? It could have gone either way. And because Florida went to Bush in the end, Bush won the 2000 election. Now the popular vote, take a look at this. Al Gore got 48.4% of the popular vote and Bush only got 47.9% of the popular vote. So who got more of the popular vote? Al Gore. But who won the electoral college? George W. Bush. And that's why he became president number 43. There was a long time before it was called, though. You know, typically you have an election and you know by the next day, maybe two days later. But in this particular case, we had to wait um, a month or two before we knew that Bush was the president. I remember it very well. I was a big fan of George W. Bush because I'm a Texan and I, and I, I, I just like him. I still like him, even though I wasn't. He's not my favorite president ever. Um, uh, I just liked him personally. I believe he's a brother in Christ and this kind of thing. Uh, so I remember the night waiting up to hear him give his uh, acceptance speech and he never came out. I remember he was in Austin and it was raining and we waited till three o'clock in the morning and he never came out. And then, then we had to wait and wait and wait until it finally was called and he became uh, our 43rd president. All right, very soon. So he was inaugurated in January and it was September when this horrible incident took place. All right, so this is 2001. You can ask your parents. They will remember where they were that day. It was a Tuesday morning. I remember very clearly. It was very early in the morning, about 8 a.m., uh, when we heard the news that an airplane had hit the World Trade Center. Uh, of course, at the very beginning, we thought it was an accident that an airplane had, you know, crashed into the World Trade Center. And then 20 minutes later, a second airplane crashed into the second tower. And that's when we knew that we were under attack. And it, and it was a, a, a very fearsome time, fearful time in America. Let's watch a little something about it. Sep 
September 11th, 2001. A day of grief. A day of courage. This is how that day unfolded. My daughter called me. She said, uh, a plane just flew into the World Trade Center. I said, no, nah, you gotta be kidding me. It's gotta be a pipe of cub or some clown was flying down the river. At 8.46 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11 from Boston, with 92 aboard, traveling at a speed of 470 miles per hour, strikes the North Tower of the World Trade Center complex. Within minutes, officials coordinate the citywide emergency response. Their base of operations is a state-of-the-art command center located on the 23rd floor of 7 World Trade Center. With one tower in flames, the tragedy is only beginning. It is 9.03 when United Airlines Flight 175, with 65 aboard, traveling at the speed of 590 miles per hour, smashes into the south tower of the World Trade Center. This aircraft strikes the corner of the South Tower. It rips a diagonally shaped gash from the 84th to the 78th floors. The South Tower lasts only 56 minutes before it succumbs at 9.59 a.m. A dust cloud billows outward for blocks. Victims stagger away. At 10.28, the television mast atop the North Tower spears straight down. Once the collapse started, there really wasn't any way to stop it. It was just going to go all the way down once it got started. Chaos in New York City. Power is down in Lower Manhattan. Phone lines jammed with more than 230 million calls. Hundreds of firefighters trapped in the towers. Hundreds more race to the scene. Falling debris from the collapse of the North and South Towers ignites fires in the neighboring buildings of the World Trade Center. World Trade 4, 5, and 6 are ablaze. World Trade 7, the building housing the city's command center, burns unchecked for seven hours. At 5.20, it collapses. The city's emergency nerve center is destroyed. Somewhere in that time, and it's very hard to keep track of time during this, they had been ordered to evacuate number seven by the Port Authority. To this day, we don't know who gave that order, but whoever it was saved a lot of people's lives. With New York a war zone, some residents walk across the Brooklyn Bridge to get out of the city. Others seek escape in vessels piloted by the Army Corps of Engineers. At 7.45 p.m., the New York Police Department says 78 officers are missing and estimates that 200 firefighters are dead. At 10.56 p.m., police officials say they believe there are victims alive in the rubble of the World Trade Center. Working with urban search and rescue teams, there was a lot of areas to be searched underneath the debris field. There were voids that had to be searched for possible live people. September 11th, 2001, the longest and most tragic day in New York's history, is drawing to a close. was in Florida at the time. He was actually in a school uh, group. He was with a, with a, sitting with some school children. I think they were um, kindergartners. He was reading a book to them. 
And this is one of his aides coming to whisper in his ear what has just happened. And so many people criticized Bush for sitting there and not, you know, jumping up and getting out. But his main concern, of course, he knew there was a big problem. He didn't want to scare the children. And so he sat there for a few minutes and he said, well, I've got to go. It's, you know, bye kids. And then he got on his plane and he was taken. He was whisked away somewhere. We didn't even know where he was because people were afraid that he was, you know, a target as well. Furthermore, there were other planes in the sky that were unaccounted for. Two more planes unaccounted for. Let's see. <laughs> One report said, and we can't confirm any of this, that a plane may have hit one of the two towers of the World Trade Center. Oh, my God. That looks like a second plane. Our belief at the moment is that an aircraft has crashed into the Pentagon. By 9.34 a.m., it had become clear to air controllers that yet another plane had been hijacked. Then word started reaching the press. Across the scanner in our newsroom was said that there was a flight that was missing. There had been a flight that they thought was heading towards Pittsburgh or Johnstown, which is where I was, and they couldn't get in touch with it. They were talking about Flight 93. It had changed direction and was apparently now over Pennsylvania. All indications were that the plane was heading towards the nation's capital but the hijackers had been careful to turn off the transponder, cutting all communication with air traffic control. From a plane near Cleveland, a call came into the GTE phone center. It was particularly alarming. When I took over the call, there was a gentleman on the line, very soft-spoken, calm. The soft-spoken gentleman was Todd Beamer, a passenger on United 93. I asked him to explain to me in detail what is happening on the plane. He told me there were three people that was taken over the flight. They tied red bandanas around their head, got up, and that that was when they forced their way into the, the cabin. But when the hijackers stormed the cockpit, nobody on Flight 93 was primed to stop them. Prior to September 11th, the way flight attendants were trained on a plane was to, to listen to the hijackers, to stay calm, and to, to comply with, with what their demands were. Unreleased recordings indicate a struggle in the cockpit. Well, in the cockpit, I, I think that what happened is the pilots uh, had been subdued. Uh, I think their necks had been slashed. And they're strapped in. They've got no way of defending themselves. You can't turn around and fight. They're just sitting ducks. But it only got worse. From the hijackers, there was a horrifying announcement. The hijackers on the intercom saying, there's a bomb on board. We have control of this plane. We're going back to the airport. On the air phone, Todd Beamer had informed operator Lisa Jefferson about the hijackers' tactics. He told me um, that they've taken control of the plane. The plane is going down. At this point, he raised his voice. He said, we're going down. We're going down. No, we're coming back up. Wait, we're turning around. We're going back north. I think we're going north. At this point, I don't know where we're going. In fact, they had turned around and were now going east. At 9.35, it appeared that the hijackers were headed for Washington, D.C. But this was no ordinary hijacking. The attack on the World Trade Center would soon become known to the passengers on Flight 93, who called relatives. And that's when they knew that this plane wasn't just being flown back to an airport. Once those people on board that plane knew it, there was, they knew there was no going back. I mean, this was, this was the new reality of, of what we face now, and, and they were the first ones that realized they needed to do something. In the air above Pennsylvania, a plot was brewing. Ty told me that him and a few other guys were thinking about jumping the guy with the bomb. He felt that he had to do to try to save the plane, at least try to get the plane to land safely. And I told him that he had every hope, and I had hope for him that they could land the plane safely. He turned from me to speak to someone else, and he said, um, are you ready? I couldn't hear their response. He said, okay. 
let's roll. That's the last I heard from Todd Beamer. The line was still open, but it was very silent. I didn't hear anything else. I kept that phone line open for about 15 additional minutes. And while our operations center was tracking the call, we heard that the plane had crashed in Pittsburgh. And I knew that was his flight. I felt that I had just lost a good friend. A 35-foot deep pit in Pennsylvania became the grave of everybody on Flight 93. People were drawn to Flight 93 because they felt those people on board were the first warriors in the battle against terrorism. And that's a theme you see in this temporary memorial over and over again in the messages people leave. Thank you for fighting back. Thank you for starting this fight against terrorists. I think people have thought that through and thought, would I do that? These people did something special. All right, so that was the third plane, but there was a fourth plane, all right? And I can't remember which order it went in. I thought that we heard about the Pentagon plane last. I was a reporter for the Washington Post. My assignment was uh, covering the Pentagon as an installation, uh, a large military installation in the Washington region. We have just been attacked in, in an act of war. This is the military's command center. And the Pentagon, when it was built, there was criticism at the time that what the military was creating was the, the world's largest bombing target. You can't really get a grasp for how big the Pentagon is until you see it from the air. The Pentagon, in a way, is, is five separate buildings that are built next to each other. It's these five wedges. You also have five rings that divide it up further. By any measure, it's the biggest office building in the world. A building with 17 miles of corridors, a 35-acre roof, a building where 20,000 people would go to work every morning. You have a building that needs to swing into action to start dealing with this new war. As a reporter, your instinct is to go to the scene. And as I got closer, there was this uh, enormous black plume. In the middle of this beautiful blue sky morning in Washington, you had this, uh, this ugly plume of black smoke. From where I was standing, you could see these Navy personnel who had come to help pull people out of the damaged area, which was the Navy Command Center. You could see the water between ankle and half calf deep. It wasn't occurring to me, it was jet fuel. The plane struck the building right at, at about a 40 degree angle. The wings pretty much disintegrated on impact, uh, but the, the fuselage blew open a hole in the wall, in the limestone facade of the Pentagon, and, and the rest of the aircraft followed in and continued all the way through the E-ring, the D-ring, the C-ring. When a plane came through, if you can imagine, a room full of partition furniture, and you have this force coming through there, it's taking all of that furniture and pe people and everything. This hole were popped out. It was kind of into that area where everything had been shoved into. Um, yeah. I left the building through what's called the mall entrance. And the and first thing you could see, obviously, is smoke and flame. And as I get closer and closer, I see bits and pieces of something littering the grass, the field. And the first thing that was recognizable was a big piece of the fuselage. Um, it was white with a big red A on it, American Airlines. And then I came around the outbuilding, and then it was like a dream sequence, because uh, there before me were some um, either dead or gravely injured people laying on the ground. All right, 
so the Pentagon got hit as well that day. So here is George Bush, you know, uh, only eight months president, and he is in New York City standing on top of the rubble. When those buildings came crumbling down, we were shocked. We had no idea the buildings would do something like that. You know, being hit by a plane was one thing, and then the whole things came down. Uh, as you can, as you know, people in the buildings were killed, people on the planes were killed, and then people when the buildings came down were killed. Um, and some of the people who couldn't get out jumped off. It was just horrible. The whole thing was horrible. And several days later, we have the president standing on top of the rubble, and he's speaking out to the people who are gathered there, mostly uh, first responders uh, and things like that, some people coming to look for their loved ones who hadn't heard from them and this kind of thing. And the famous quote here was George uh, W. Bush said uh, that the people, he's speaking in the, in the little uh, megaphone thing there, and the people out there said, we can't hear you. And he answered back, you may not hear me, but I can hear you. And the whole world will hear us soon. And so he promised to do something about it. Uh, this is one of the most iconic pictures. These guys found a flag somewhere in the area and they put it up. So these uh, firemen decided to put that flag up in the midst of that destruction that took place. I will say all of the uh, dust and everything in the air wreaked havoc on these guys for years. Some of them ended up with lung cancer and other uh, horrible debilitating diseases just from helping to clean up the rubble out there. We of course got all cleaned up eventually and now there instead of the two towers we have one tower uh, and then we have two where the footprints were, so that would be the holes where the basements were of these buildings. Those had been turned into reflecting pools, I think. I've not been up there, uh, but it's sort of a, a tribute. And then a new building built uh, elsewhere close by to be the World Trade Center now. Okay, so obviously the very worst uh, attack on, on our uh, country. It was even uh, worse than... Um, than Pearl Harbor. All right, I want to finish the year with this guy. He's an Australian guy who's going to talk about American greatness. G'day there. As an outsider, I have a unique perspective from which to view America. As an American friend said to me, sometimes it takes someone on the outside to remind us what we're like on the inside. I'm an Australian. You might have already guessed that. And I love my home country. And I am proud that my nation has long been a reliable American ally. But I know that Australia is not America and that my country has not achieved what America has achieved. No country in human history has. What makes America different? There are many answers, but start with one you might not have thought of. Most people think America is all about success. I see it a little differently. I think America is all about failing. Most people in the world don't get the chance to fail, but Americans take it for granted. Only Americans say, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. There's even an academic study to prove this. According to a study by Harvard Business School professor Stephen Rogers, most entrepreneurs fail four times before they succeed. Success takes timing and hard work, some good luck, many other factors. But to succeed, you must be given the chance to fail and you must accept responsibility if you do. I love that about Americans. At their best, they don't blame others. They learn from their mistakes and do better the next time. And in America, there's almost always a next time. Nowhere else are you as free to take entrepreneurial risks. Talk to someone who has tried to start a small business in Germany or Brazil, and you'll see what I mean. From the outside looking in, I can only admire this. And I'm not the only one. Just take a look at the CEOs of major Silicon Valley companies. You will see the names of entrepreneurs from all over the world. India, Pakistan, Russia, Israel, you name the country. Why did they come to America to innovate? Because there's a lot of money here? Yes, of course, that's part of it. But there's a lot of money in London and Berlin and Tokyo as well. They came to America because America gave them the chance to fail and therefore the best chance in the world to succeed. And the rest of the world can thank their lucky stars for America's economic success. Not only is America by far the world's largest economy, it is also the world's largest consumer. And the world's economy depends on being able to sell to America. It would also be perfectly natural for Americans to want to keep all this wealth to themselves. But they don't. Just the opposite, in fact. 
America has been the most selfless nation in the history of the world. Yet another way in which America is different. What other nation fights for the freedom of others? In Europe, in two world wars, in Korea, in Vietnam, and yes, in Iraq. In all those wars, America had very little or nothing to gain economically. Whenever there is a humanitarian crisis anywhere in the world, Haiti after a hurricane, Indonesia after a tsunami, who is the first to rush aid to these places? No matter where the calamity is, at home or abroad, Americans invariably raise millions of dollars almost instantly to send food and clothing and supplies to people in distress they don't know and will never meet. Who else does that? I love that America is different. What worries me about America is that I see her increasingly trying to act like other nations. It worries me to see that so many Americans are drawn to the ossified ideas of Europe. That's the old world. It was old in 1776 even, when America broke away from it. Why would America want to reverse its own revolution? Why would Americans want to follow the economic and social model of a continent that they can see is failing economically and socially? Do Americans really want to emulate France or Greece? It worries me to see so many Americans wallowing in victim status, oh. blaming outside forces for their predicament, rather than accepting responsibility and seeking to improve themselves. It worries me to see American schools debasing America's own glorious history. It worries me to see America's debt and government grow larger while its military and its personal freedoms shrink. It worries me because a weak, self-doubting America is bad for everyone, everywhere, who loves freedom. But these worries never last long, because each time I visit America, I encounter a people who are confident, competitive, courageous, faithful, idealistic, innovative, inspirational, charitable, and optimistic. It's like no other place in the world. I pray it stays that way. I'm Nick Adams for Prager University. Okay, so I just wanted to leave you with the idea uh, that America is a place to be proud of. Okay. Um, he mentioned in there that it was it was a shame that schools were teaching you know n you know not teaching the glories of America. Well, obviously I I'm not that. I'll, I'll tell you about the bad things. Sure, we have to own up to that kind of thing. But in the end, we know that our Constitution is uh, it's a glorious thing. All right, it's not the Bible, okay, and this is not the only place that God loves. But it is uh, freedom is the center point of that, and it's worth fighting for. Uh, and so we don't have to run America down. We can remember how great America is. And, and I love the way he put it so succinctly about our optimism and our generosity. And I believe all of that's true. Okay, gang. Well, it's been great having you this year as my American uh, history students. And uh, I'll see you next week when we do our projects. Okay, everybody? Appreciate it. Appreciate y'all. Have a great, great summer. <laughs>